the last book that John Lee dictated was on the topic of refuge. He didn't write his books, you know, he would dictate them. The last one he dictated was when he was in the hospital, shortly before he died. And it's essentially a book on the extent to which we're dependent on the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and the extent to which we want to take that dependence and turn it into independence. Because after all, as the Buddha himself said, he only points out the way. We have to follow it. You have to trust that he knows what he's doing, where he's pointing us. Because you'll look at the way action happens in the world. And you can see why some people would say that it's, things are pretty chaotic. There's no clear pattern of causality at all. It's because the pattern is so complex. You've got results of past karma coming in. You've got your present karma. And it creates a complex system. As the Buddha said, if you try to trace back all patterns of cause and effect in your own act, even in just your own actions, you would go crazy to say nothing of all the actions that are happening in the world. So it's good that we have someone like the Buddha who had a very large perspective on action. You could see the big patterns. And the nature of a complex system is that the complexity comes from simple patterns interacting. And if you can ferret out the simple patterns, then you know what to do. So the fact that we take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma is directly related to that. His Dharma points out the pattern. And if we trust that the Buddha knew what he was talking about, we can trust that we can focus on the simple, simple elements in the pattern that he pointed out. That is, if you do skillful things, if you act on skillful intentions, the results will be good. If you act on unskillful intentions, the results are going to be bad. That sounds simple, but again, because the way things work out, because your actions have results that happen in the present moment, and then they have results that happen over a little bit of time, and then results that happen over a long period of time. These results can interact in complex ways. The other drawback of the fact that things are so complex is that once you decide to start following the path, it's very easy to get discouraged. Because after all, in a complex system, you can put lots of new energy into the system and it just seems to disappear. If you're sitting here meditating and focusing on the breath, and the mind doesn't seem to get anywhere at all. Sometimes it seems to be worse. Or things can be going really well and you start getting complacent, not realizing that you've still got things coming in from the past that you don't know about. This is where it's good to have a Sangha, people who have practiced the path before, who have some experience, and can give you warnings when you're getting complacent and give you encouragement when you're getting down. Of course, all this comes down to your willingness to take this kind of refuge and to trust that it really will direct you in the right way. But then again, what are you being asked to do? You're asked to do something honorable. Take responsibility for your actions. An emotion comes up, and you can't just say, well, this is the force of the universe acting through me. I've got to give in. You're free to ask, is this something I really want to follow or not? This is a, the Buddha said, it's a noble path. The word ardiya can also mean honorable. It's an honorable path. where there's no room for throwing the responsibility off on other people. As John Lee pointed out, when you're taking refuge, we're taking the example of the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, the lessons we can learn from them, and then we try to develop them within ourselves. So we have those qualities within us, too, the ones that they developed. And as I said, they never said that they had exclusive rights to those qualities. These are qualities that we all have. The ability to be mindful, the ability to be alert, to be resolute in what we do. Now, there's a large part of the mind that would rather not make the effort and would like to 
dismiss the whole thing. But you can ask yourself, what kind of part of the mind is that? Where will it lead you? As long as we're human beings, we might as well act on the possibility that we can be honorable beings, we can be responsible beings. And it's within our power, with the help of the guidance of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, to see what's skillful and what's not skillful within ourselves. So it's a combination of being dependent and interde interdependent, with the general thrust going to more and more independence in your practice. As for people who would rather not be responsible, the Buddha wasn't interested in teaching them. So you can ask yourself if you want to be the kind of person that the Buddha would just put aside, or if you want to be the kind of person that can benefit from the fact that there is this path available, and there are people who have made it available, continue to make it available, and it gives direction to your life. Because otherwise, what is life? Things develop for a while, and then this falls apart and that falls apart. The body starts doing things that you never thought it would do as you get older. And it doesn't ask your permission. We like to think of life as having a meaning and a purpose, like a, a good plot in a story, that things come to closure at the end. Well, things stop, but they don't come to closure. There are lots of loose ends in life. So the life of the body doesn't go anywhere much at all. It goes, it develops for a while, and then it begins to deteriorate, and it falls apart in ways that, to some extent, you can prevent, but ultimately you can't. So that's the, the life of the body. As for the life of the mind, it doesn't have to go that way. I mean, you already decide that it's going that way. You see a lot of people, the minds deteriorate as they get older. But there is a possibility there's something in the mind that doesn't deteriorate. Something that actually can be developed, good qualities that can be developed, good choices that can be made all the way through the, to the end. And with that possibility there, would you want to throw it away? Would you want to turn your back on it? talks about his teachings being a safe bet, in the sense that if you believe in the power of action and believe in your power of your choice, believe that there is something to you that is or some potential in your experience that is not just an aspect of the body, then you're inclined to act in ways that are more skillful. And there is a possibility that those skillful actions might lead to something really good. If you don't believe in that, then you throw away the possibility. Now, if it turns out that things don't go in the direction that the Buddha taught, at the very least you've given it a try. You've tried to push in the direction of what is honorable, what is noble in life. If you don't take his teachings, then you just turn your back on what's honorable and noble. What good is that? We've got a noble path, and the Buddha encourages us that we all have the potential to follow it. As he said, if it were not possible to develop skillful qualities, he wouldn't bother teaching people to develop skillful qualities. If it were not possible to abandon unskillful ones, he wouldn't teach us. In other words, something comes up in the mind, you don't have to follow the, the current, as they say. The current of greed, or the current of anger, or the current of delusion. There are also good currents in the mind. There's a current of goodwill, compassion. These are things you can follow. So you want to be particular in what currents you follow. You can take, you can make the choice. And we develop mindfulness and alertness and concentration as we meditate here on the breath.
to put us in a better and better position to make that choice and to make it well. It's in this way that the Buddha's teachings are empowering. But with power comes responsibility. To realize each time you breathe in, breathe out, you have the choice. You're going to stay with the breath, develop your concentration, develop your mindfulness. You're going to flow off someplace else. If you keep coming back to the breath, given the complexity of the mind, it might be a while before you can see the benefits that the Buddha talks about. But when they do come, they're really rewarding. And there's a greater sense of independence that comes inside. Because otherwise, if you're just subject to the ups and downs of life, if your mind's happiness depends on things being good outside and gets destroyed when things are not good outside, you're a slave to every little thing that comes in your ears and eyes and all your other senses. But we've seen all around us people who can be miserable in spite of good situations and can be happy in spite of bad situations. The mind does have this potential for independence, so you want to use it in a good way. Straighten yourself out from within. This is the hard part of the teaching. If the Buddha could come in and straighten you out from inside, things would be very easy. But we suffer because of our own lack of skill, and it's from within that we have to solve the problem. But he gives you the tools, points out aspects of what it's like to be inside a mind, inside a body, that you can use to your advantage. You can use the breath to your advantage. You can use your ability to choose where you focus to your advantage. He gives you the tools. He gives you the encouragement. He gives you the warnings, too. Because just as when we have the power to do good, we also have the power to make a mess of things. Delusion is a big problem in the practice. So we have to check ourselves again and again and again. If we make mistakes, be willing to admit the mistakes. Because it's only that way that you can learn. So from dependence to independence, that's the general direction of the path. After all, it is a path that leads to release, as the Buddha said. All of his teachings have one taste, just like the ocean has a single taste. The ocean has a taste of salt. His teachings have the taste of release. They all head to freedom. They lead us from a place of confusion. So it's good to have the help and to be willing to accept the help that the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha offer. They offer it not to tie you down, but to put you on your own two feet. So that you can walk the path to total freedom.